Jacob Cawthard is a software engineering manager and former co-founder and CEO of the startup Skillsbook. He's also author of the blog, The Roots of Progress, um, where he's been writing about the history of technology and industry since 2017. His posts have been promoted on Tyler Cowen's blog, Marginal Revolution, which is a great blog, and in the Twitter feeds of economists and ec economic historians, including Noah Smith and Anton Hahn. Please welcome Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, really great to see everybody here. Uh, when we set this up, I think it was a week ago or less that we just announced this, and uh, I told Jasmine we'd be lucky to get like five or ten people to show up. Um, thank you all for coming out to the Presidio on a weekday evening. Um, seeing all the energy around this community is really, uh, is really exciting to me. Um, a lot of us are here because of this article that Tyler and Patrick uh, posted or uh, wrote, uh, published in The Atlantic about a month ago, calling for a new science of progress, uh, a new discipline of progress studies. Um, it quickly galvanized this small movement. Um, we've got a Slack group now. Uh, we've got these meetups. This is the first one. Uh, Jasmine has been doing a great job starting to organize this community. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, so I volunteered to talk about the topic I've been researching recently and got a draft of a blog post on, which is the history of steel. Um, so I'm going to do that. But since this is our first meetup and since I think a lot of you are here because you're as interested in progress studies as such as you, as you are in a metal, um, I, I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna sort of conclude with some of my thoughts on, uh, just very personal thoughts on what progress studies means to me, why I'm interested in it, and what I'm doing with it. But first, let's talk about metal. Metalworking is one of the oldest crafts. It goes way back before recorded history. Uh, in fact, we define some of our historical ages in terms of metals, right? the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. Uh, the first metal in widespread use was copper. Uh, in this era, uh, in, in the Bronze Age, iron was uh, virtually unknown. In fact, it was really only known in one rare form, which is meteorites. So when meteors would fall to Earth, sometimes they had metallic iron in them. And you can just imagine a huge rock falls from the sky, you're a primitive uh, human who goes, or maybe a Bronze Age human, uh, and you go up to, you've got this rock, it looks like it might be useful for something, and you go to do what you normally do with rocks, which is to chip away at it, and instead of chipping, it dents, like a metal. That must have been pretty surprising. Um, so you can imagine that iron had almost a mythical status. In fact, uh, early words for iron, uh, like an ancient Egyptian and Sumerian, roughly translate to metal from heaven. It's like a gift of, of the gods. This is a dagger that was buried with the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun. Uh, based on its nickel content, it's believed to be meteoric iron, meteoric in origin. Uh, today, of course, iron and steel are everywhere. They're in buildings, both in steel girders and in the reinforced concrete. They're in vehicles, trains and their rails, ships, cars, planes. They're in infrastructure. Bridges, towers, electrical wires. They're in household objects all around us, appliances. Uh, and this material, the iron that we make today, steel, is so pure and consistent that it would have been hailed by the ancients as a miracle, a feat of craftsmanship possible only through divine intervention. So what is this stuff? Why is it so hard to make? And how did it go from mythical to mundane? Let's set some context. I always like to begin at the beginning. Why do we care about metal? What is it useful for? Um, I think of the uh, main classes of materials in the pre-industrial world as falling into six major groups. Stone and wood were known, of course, from earliest times. Our tribal ancestors used these materials. With the advent of settled societies, we got the crafts. Metalworking, pottery, 
glass blowing, weaving. Uh, so these are kind of the six biggest groups of materials uh, before the industrial era. Stone, wood, metal, clay, glass, and textiles. Um, now if you want to understand why is any particular material the ideal material for a particular purpose, okay, you basically ask three questions. So one is, is it suitable for the job? Does it have the right properties, material properties for the thing that you want to do? You wouldn't want to make a hammer out of wood. It's too soft. You wouldn't want to make a backpack out of stone. It's too hard and too heavy. You wouldn't want to make straws out of paper. <laughs> San Francisco. <laughs> um, second, this is less obvious. Uh, can, can the material be easily made into the right shape? Uh, so different materials are worked in different ways. Right? Stone is formed by chiseling and polishing. Wood by carving and sanding. Metal by forging or casting. And so on. And then, of course, there's the question of cost. I think these are the three main uh, sort of aspects or criteria that make a, ma a material suitable for a, a given purpose. So of these six major categories, only stone and metal are hard enough to really hold a cutting edge for tools or weapons, very important objects. But stone, again, is brittle. So uh, it can really only be formed by chipping uh, or polishing, whereas metal is more malleable. It can be formed by uh, hammering, forging into shape, uh, working it with tools, uh, or in molten form, casting into a mold. And that, uh, that brittleness of stone has another drawback too, which is if the stone takes abuse, gets knocked really hard or whatever, uh, it is liable to crack or shatter, uh, or chip or fragment, whereas metal being a little more elastic might simply dent or scratch, much easier to repair or to keep using. Um, so because of metal's hardness, uh, sorry, because of its strength, rather, it makes a good structural material. Because of its hardness, it's good for tools, especially cutting tools. And because of its resistance to heat, it's good for engines or cooking utensils. <coughs> and iron is the strongest metal of them all. So that's why metal in general and iron in particular are desirable, why we care about them as human beings trying to, to do economic things. Where does it come from? Well, one thing I've learned in my research is that there, there's really no such thing as a natural resource. Uh, or another way I like to think about it, all natural resources are highly inconvenient. They come to us in like the least you know, convenient form. And we have to do a lot of work, a lot of processing in order to make them usable. This is true for metal as well. So iron is abundant in the Earth's crust. But again, it's rarely found in metallic form, except in those meteorites. Instead, it's found in the form of ore. And to get uh, metal out of its ore, any ore, you have to go through a process called smelting. Now, when I began this research, I had a hilariously inaccurate uh, view of what smelting was. And so I'm going to share this with you. So I thought, okay, ore is a kind of a rock, right? And uh, it's got metal in it. I guess they're like little bits of metal uh, in the rock, right? And you've got to get the metal out. So how do you do that? Well, you bake it, you put it over a fire or something, right? And then I guess the metal drips out. <laughs> cool and whoops I guess you better put a pan in there to like catch the metal as it's dripping out. This was kind of what I thought smelting probably was. Okay this is totally wrong. <laughs> uh, if you take one thing away from this talk please do not have this be it. Because <laughs> it turns out smelting is nothing like, heck ore is nothing like this at all. Okay this is iron ore. Uh, it is a rock, I got that part right. But the metal is not little bits of metal in the rock. Uh, it's actually, this reddish stuff is the iron ore. Uh, it's actually oxidized. So this is, uh, this is kind of rust colored. That's not an accident. This basically is rust. Um, uh, and so to get the iron out is a chemical process. Smelting is a chemical process. Okay, so how does it work? Let's go back to the earliest days. This is how you might smelt uh, iron ore. So uh, this is a small furnace called a bloomery. Maybe it's about three feet tall. 
You would fill this whole thing with iron ore and uh, charcoal, and then uh, helps if you add lime as well. I'll explain why in a minute. And then you set the whole thing on fire. So you just build a big fire in this furnace. Uh, you ignite the entire mass. Give it some air. Let it burn for hours. And if you get everything just right, a spongy mass of iron collects at the bottom of the furnace. Uh, it's red hot. You can take it out with tongs. Uh, and this mass of iron is called a bloom, hence the name of the, uh, the furnace is a bloomery. Now you have a, a little bit of a problem with this bloom. Remember I said all resources are inconvenient and iron ore is no exception. So not only do we not find iron in pure form in nature, we don't even find iron ore in pure form, right? Iron ore is always mixed with stuff. There's a bunch of crap in it that you don't really want. Contaminants like phosphorus or sulfur. Uh, and these things can get in your metal, and if even small amounts of them get in the metal, they'll make it weak or brittle. You really don't want that. So part of the smelting process, you need to get rid of the impurities. Uh, that's what the lime is for. So lime acts as what's called a flux, which basically just means it gets the impurities out, separates them out into a, a, a mass or a material called slag. Slag is the term for the waste material, and you can run that off. Uh, but some slag stays in the bloom. Uh, so the first thing you got to do is uh, put the bloom on a table or an anvil and pound it with a hammer. That's what that hammer is for. Pounding it smooths it out and it also forces the remaining slag out of the iron. Okay, now you have a usable lump of iron. But you don't want a lump of iron, you want a thing, right? You want a fork or a belt buckle or a horseshoe or a sword. So how do you form your iron into a thing? Well. Uh, fortunately, the iron is relatively soft. Uh, I don't mean soft like a pillow, but for a metal, it's soft. And so it can be worked with tools. This is what a blacksmith does. Right? So here's a blacksmith at the anvil. Uh, the iron uh, has gotten red hot in the forge. It's softer when it's hot. Um, and so you can hit it with a hammer. You can put it in a vise. You can sort of just use whatever tools you want to, to, to pound it and twist it into shape. Um, again, it's softer when hot, so you keep returning it to the forge, getting it red hot, and then you can pound it for like 30 seconds to a minute before it cools off. You have to literally strike while the iron is hot. That's where that phrase comes from. Um, and because this form of iron can be worked with tools, it is known as wrought iron. But there's another problem. Uh, I mentioned the iron is soft. It's actually too soft uh, to be ideal for many purposes. Might be okay if you're making pots and pans, uh, but if you're making a sword, you're out on the battlefield, you don't want your sword to be even like a little bit soft, right? <laughs> you know, if you're gonna go up against this other guy and he's got a harder sword than you, <laughs> so you wanna make the iron harder. And so ancient blacksmiths found ways to make the iron harder and tougher. Um, one thing that they discovered is if you uh, put the, the wrought iron back in the fire, especially like in a bed of charcoal or something, and heat it up, the surface of the material at least will become hard. Um, doing it this way doesn't make it hard all the way through, but does something to this, kind of the skin of the material. And this harder form of iron, by the way, is steel. That's, that's essentially what this means. I'll refine that definition later, but for now just think of the hardened form of iron as steel. Uh, and so this is good for forming a cutting edge on a sword or a knife or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, in ancient times, people didn't really know what was going on, but something seemed to be getting into the surface of the material, right? Making it harder. They found that it was even better if after you uh, uh, did this, hardened the material, instead of letting it cool quickly, uh, you would cool it, sorry, and let it, instead of letting it cool slowly, you would cool it quickly by plunging it into a bucket of water or oil. So this bucket here might be filled with water or oil. This process is called quenching, and when it cools down quickly, um, then uh, it, it's, it, the hardening is, is even uh, uh, more effective. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's too effective, the metal gets so hard that it becomes brittle, and you don't necessarily want brittle. So what you can do is you can put it back in the fire, heat it again, but not quite as hot, and that kind of lets the metal relax a little bit and uh, trade off some of its hardness which in technical material science terms is resistance to scratching, uh, and instead get a little more toughness or strength, which is uh, ability to take abuse and absorb energy, which is really what you want. 
That process is called tempering. So you may have heard, if you've ever read anything about ancient blacksmiths, quenching and tempering. Or if you watch Game of Thrones or whatever, read fantasy, I'm sure they do this, right? The blacksmith takes the thing out of the forge and right in the, in the water. That's what's going on here. Um, but again, this, this process only really gets the surface of the material hard. So what do you do if you want the material to be hard all the way through? Well, one thing you can do is you can do this process to many thin strips of material and then pound them together. Uh, and you get this, uh, so that gets you something that's kind of more, has more hardness all the way through. Uh, and it actually makes these really nice patterns which came to be valued aesthetically in their own right. And so this is called pattern welding. In Japanese sword making, if you've ever heard how they made the katanas, this is, uh, they got a similar thing going on where they actually, they pound it flat and then they would like fold it over on itself and then pound flat again and fold and do this pounding and flattening and folding many times. It's a related technique. Okay. So uh, this gets you something hard, but again, it's, uh, it's in these layers, these strips. It's not really homogenous. If you want steel that's actually homogenous, strong steel all the way through, there were a few ways known to the ancient world. Difficult, time-consuming, expensive ways. Uh, one of them was a process called cementation. And this here is a cementation furnace. It's basically very similar to that heating process that heats just the, or that hardens the surface of the material, except you bake it for days or weeks. And if you let it go that long, the hardness gets all the way through the material. There was also a process known in ancient India involving crucibles. They would melt the iron in crucibles along with other materials, and that would also make a very nice homogenous steel. It was known as Wootz steel. It was exported to Damascus and made into legendary swords. Have you ever heard of Damascus swords or Damascus steel? Uh, the steel actually didn't come from Syria. It came from India. It was Wootz steel. These are some uh, Syrian sword makers. Okay. This is roughly uh, what was known to the ancient world and what they had uh, at their disposal for making iron and steel. Let's fast forward a bit to the Middle Ages and see how this progressed. Those little bloomeries, um, they were nice, but they would only produce a relatively small amount of iron, maybe 50 pounds in a bloom. Not very efficient, uh, especially if you have to build a furnace and then pretty much like take it apart to get the, to get the bloom out. So to be more efficient at this process and make more iron for heat, you build a bigger furnace, right? It can hold more ore, it's gonna make a bigger bloom. And uh, there was this evolutionary process where they made them bigger and bigger and bigger. The bigger a furnace gets, the more air it needs. And so uh, at first you can, you can pump with a bellows. Uh, some furnaces they would actually build into a hillside and take advantage of the wind blowing into the hill. Uh, Eventually, these things got so big that the, fur the bellows had to be powered, and so they would build them on a river and have a water wheel. So this is one of those huge furnaces, and because of the amount of air it needed, this is known as a blast furnace. It needs a blast of air. So this is a cutaway view. You can see how big it is because of the people who are, um, who are operating this thing. It's like, what, 20 feet tall or something. Uh, this is what it might look like from the outside. So uh, on the right, that structure with the domed roof, that's actually where the furnace is. You can see the smoke coming out. Um, in the middle, you might be able to see the water wheel. And that's turning the bellows, which are pumping the, uh, the blast. Okay, great. We're making lots more iron now. We're making several hundred pound, few hundred, several hundred pound blooms. You know, we can take them out. Um, they're, they're, it takes multiple people to like pull this thing out of the furnace. And they got to cut it in half before, before they can even work with it. Cool. Um, but something happened to the metal in these big furnaces. As the fires burned hotter and longer, and as the ore was in there for a longer period of time, it started to melt. And so you get this molten iron, and it would run out of your furnace. And uh, that's OK. But when the metal cools, you might try to do with it the same thing you do with a bloom. You take it out and you pound it with a hammer. And if you did that, what you would find is that the molten iron, once it is cooled, is brittle. If you try to put it through your normal process, you pound it with a hammer, it will break. It doesn't, it's not malleable, it doesn't deform like the bloom. So for, to the early iron smelters, uh, this sucked. This is a nuisance, right? This is a waste product. We can't do anything with it, right? We can't. Put it through our normal process. All you can do is throw it back into the furnace and remelt it. Eventually, somebody kind of figured out, well, wait a sec. 
There is a thing that we do with uh, molten metal. We can cast it. And uh, just like, so they used to cast bronze. Somebody figured out at a certain point you could cast iron as well. And so because this molten form of the iron is basically only good for casting, it is known as cast iron. So we have wrought iron uh, produced one way and worked with tools. Then we have cast iron produced uh, a different way and poured into molds. It's good for making things like cannon. This is a cast iron cannon. In the religious wars of the 1600s, that was very popular. Um, side note, by the way, credit where due. China was probably making cast iron for like a thousand years before this. As uh, far as I can tell, that China didn't actually influence the development of uh, iron and steel in the West. I haven't seen. I think the Europeans just kind of rediscovered everything like a thousand years later. So they get credit for being first, but they're just not exactly part of the story. <laughs> but I felt compelled to mention them. You know, they invented a lot of stuff first. Um, okay, cool. So the wrought iron uh, is too soft, but we have methods to harden it. The cast iron is, is hard, but it's too brittle. And so we developed methods to refine cast iron and uh, take away some of the brittleness and uh, turn it into um, wrought iron or steel. <laughs> Um, you know, it's almost as if whatever was getting into the wrought iron to make it harder during that hardening process, like the cast iron had too much of it, right? Whatever it was. So how do you refine cast iron? Well, there's a number of ways. Uh, one well-known way developed during the Industrial Revolution was called puddling. Uh, it used a furnace like this called a reverberatory furnace. The special thing about this furnace is that the uh, fuel is in one chamber and the metal is in a, is a different part. They don't come into contact. So your fuel uh, contaminants in the fuel will not adulterate the metal. Again, very important for the quality and purity of the metal uh, and its properties. Uh, so instead, the heat would kind of radiate off of the curved roof here, and that's how this furnace would work. This is how you worked the furnace. Uh, on the left here, this guy is holding an ingot of iron called pig iron, and he's about to throw it into the furnace. And then uh, in the second one, it's hard to see, but he's got a really long pole, and he's sticking it in there, and you kind of uh, turn the ingot over, um, like you're flipping burgers or something, right? And you sort of, if it melts, you kind of stir the, um, stir the molten iron. And so that was part of this process, and it, it seemed to make things go better. Uh, so, all right, I've given you a lot of information. Uh, might be a little confusing. Let me try to summarize in a bit of a diagram. So we start with iron ore, and then uh, we need to smelt it. We can smelt it in a small furnace like a bloomery, and this will get us wrought iron, which uh, we can then harden to basically make steel. Or we can put in a larger furnace, smelt it in a blast furnace, which will get us cast iron. Uh, which then needs to be refined if we want to take away that brittleness and make steel or even refine it all the way to wrought iron. And that wrought iron is soft and malleable, whereas the cast iron is hard and brittle. This is basically it's just a summary of what I've explained. But all this is kind of a mystery. All this stuff has been done by trial and error and lore for thousands of years. Nobody really understands why any of it works. Nobody really understands why these different grades of metal are the way they are, what makes the difference, why these processes produce different things, or why the different processes work. So what's going on? Why is wrought iron soft? Why is cast iron brittle? Why does steel seem to have the best of both worlds? Is something being added to the metal to harden it, or removed, or rearranged within the metal? And if it's something added, where is it coming from? Is it in the air? Is it in the fuel? Is it in the heat? That seems like a funny question to us today, but at one point, heat was hypothesized to be a type of fluid. So you can imagine that you know, they would think that maybe something, the heat itself, is getting into the metal. Well, there were lots of theories, uh, and people thought about it. So Aristotle thought that steel was a purified form of iron. Uh, and he believed that when you, were, when you went through the hardening process, that what you were doing was further refining it and getting stuff out of the iron. Not a bad theory, you know, the stronger thing is more pure. Sounds like, a, sounds like a, a, an idea you might come up with, uh, but like a lot of pre-experimental science, it was wrong. And we didn't learn the answer until the 1700s with the science of chemistry. So this guy, uh, Ray Amour, did some experiments 
where he uh, melted iron in crucibles with all sorts of different kinds of things, materials, to see what it would do to the iron. And he actually discovered that, yes, indeed, Aristotle was wrong. Steel is not a purified form of iron. It's actually a dirty form of iron. It's iron with stuff in it, something in it. He thought it was sulfurs and salts. That wasn't quite right. Uh, this guy, Bergman, in 1781, isolated the substance. He's been called the father of analytical chemistry. Uh, so he analyzed steel and isolated the substance that was in it, and he identified it as phlogiston. <laughs> People who are laughing uh, know what that phlogiston was a substance that was hypothesized to be in all combustible materials. And uh, it was like the thing that made combustion possible. It was released during combustion into the air. Uh, so this is what uh, Bergman believed was in the steel making it hard. There was just a tiny flaw in his theory, which is that the phlogiston model of combustion is false and phlogiston does not exist. Whoops. Okay, so what is it? Well, uh, just a few years later, three Frenchmen, of whom I can only find pictures of two of them, uh, Mange, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Vandermonge, <laughs> you've only got a stub page on Wikipedia. I don't know what to say. Um, but, uh, but Invisible Vandermonde, uh, Mange, and, and Berthelet, uh, identified correctly identified the mystery substance as carbon. Carbon is the material that gets into, uh, into iron to harden it, uh, or if it gets too much, makes it brittle. Uh, so it, surprise, the very material that was in the fuel that we're using to provide the heat for the chemical reaction is also the material that hardens the iron. So today we know that uh, iron with less than about 0.1% of carbon by weight, I'm rounding off here, you'll actually find different figures, but a tiny, tiny amount of carbon by weight is wrought iron, the soft kind. Um, if it's got more than about 2.1% by weight, it's cast iron, the, the hard, brittle kind. And steel is in that Goldilocks zone in between, that kind of sweet spot where it's uh, strong and tough, but not brittle. We also know that iron ore is iron oxide. Uh, it comes in different forms. Here's a couple of common forms, magnetite and hematite, different chemical formulas. And smelting is a chemical reaction where the uh, iron oxide reacts with carbon monoxide caused by the partial combustion of the carbon in the fuel. Um, and you get pure elemental, it strips away the oxygen uh, because the carbon monoxide binds with the oxygen more tightly than the iron. And so you get pure elemental iron and some carbon dioxide uh, waste product. Okay, uh, but what happens is at high temperatures, this is another thing we now know from chemistry and material science, at, at temperatures that are high enough to melt the iron, uh, iron goes through a phase change and it begins absorbing more carbon. And so that's what takes it from the wrought iron regime into the cast iron regime. It's a consequence of the temperature. Okay, so we don't want to use our tiny inefficient uh, bloomeries to just make wrought iron. We want to use our big efficient furnaces, blast furnaces, to make cast iron. But we really want to get steel, so we've got to go through this refining process. But refining is this long, difficult uh, process with guys literally standing right next to the furnace with that pole. That was a really difficult job, by the way. You're literally right next to this furnace at thousands of degrees. It was not fun work. And it was slow. So how can we do this faster? Enter Henry Bessemer. Bessemer thought about this problem a lot in the 1850s. You can see in this picture, he's thinking very hard. <laughs> How do we refine iron? Uh, well, he knew a bit of chemistry. He knew that carbon was the mystery element that we needed to remove. He also knew that oxygen readily unites with carbon. And he knew that these processes we had already, like puddling, were basically exposing the, uh, the cast iron ingots to the air. Okay. So, natural idea. What if we just used a lot more air? That's basically what the Bessemer process is. Uh, so he built this thing called the Bessemer converter. It's this huge, uh, is this huge chamber, I don't know what you call it. It's sort of egg-shaped thing. You charge the cast iron in through the top. The whole thing can actually tip over to pour out its load when it's done. This is what it looks like in person, uh, an actual photo of it. It's pretty steampunk, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and so, uh, sorry, so going back to the diagram. So the key thing is there's this pipe that air goes through, 
And it's hard to see, but in the, in the cutaway on the right, in the bottom, there's a bunch of little holes that go up through the bottom. So you pump a blast of air in up through the bottom, and it goes, it's forced through the molten cast iron to oxidize it. And when he first set this up in his, uh, in his factory uh, and turned it on, it basically did this. Boom. It erupted like a volcano. And these flames just shooting out the top of this thing. It was really frightening. Um, and it flamed like that for like 10 or 20 minutes. And then it kind of died down. This is what happens from the results from the extremely rapid oxidation of all of that um, cast iron. But the result was that this process that took days or weeks to oxidize all this stuff happened in less than 30 minutes. So now we had an extremely sped up process, and a faster process is a cheaper process. So the result of the Bessemer uh, uh, steel making process was that it decreased the price of steel by more than 80%. So your money would now buy more than five times as much steel as it used to. And this was a revolution in manufacturing. Uh, so this came right at a very fortuitous time, the age of railroads. And it, the number one use of cheap steel for a long time was um, in rails. Uh, steel is good for the locomotive. Uh, you can build a higher pressure uh, boiler if you use strong material, but it was absolutely needed for the rails. Um, rails could not be made of cast iron because they take a lot of abuse, right? You've got enormous heavy trains and their loads rolling over these rails all day, turning corners, banking, and uh, the cast iron rails would break because they were brittle. Broken rails, very dangerous. So you had to make the rails out of wrought iron, which would deform under the abuse rather than breaking. But again, wrought iron is soft. So in some particularly bad sections of track, the wrought iron rails were, had to be replaced every few months. Think about that. You've got a whole crew of men out there relaying the rails every few months because they're worn out. They replaced wrought iron rails with cheap steel after the Bessemer process, and the steel rails lasted for years. So it was a huge, uh, huge benefit, huge advantage. Steel was also used in building. Uh, so when you build a, the skeleton of a building out of steel, it can take the load of the building rather than all that weight having to go on the masonry. And so you can build different kinds of buildings, and this helped usher in the era of skyscrapers. This is the home insurance building, one of the first uh, skyscrapers. Uh, and steel plows were used to break up the tough prairie soils of the American Midwest. John Deere, you've surely heard that name in uh, agricultural equipment. The, the John Deere, the Mr. John Deere, uh, got his start by inventing the steel plow and selling it. So he also used uh, cheap steel. These are obviously just a few you know, key examples of what we did with it. Today, you know, steel is everywhere. Um, without it, the modern world would be unrecognizable. Almost all iron today is made into steel. Just try to imagine New York City without its iconic skyline. Imagine cars with paneling made of wood. <laughs> imagine that all of our food had to come packaged in heavy, brittle glass jars, no tin cans. Without steel, we probably wouldn't have powered flight, and we definitely would not have the space program. So while this metal may no longer be mythical, it is still marvelous. OK, that's steel. Like I said, I want to say a few words about progress. Uh, this is going to be a pretty personal statement about what progress studies means to me, uh, why I'm interested in it, and what I'm doing with it. Uh, I don't mean to speak for anybody else or for the group. This, uh, as Jasmine has said, this is a duocracy. Uh, there's no top-down control here. It's really very bottoms up and whoever, whatever you want to bring to it. But this is, this is what it means to me. I think we all came to this room tonight because we share something. We share a belief that progress is real, valuable, important. I see progress as a moral imperative. If you read Tyler Cowen's book, Stubborn Attachments, he talks about economic growth as a moral imperative. Um, these uh, six charts from Max Roser's Our World in Data uh, program show the progress we've made just in the last 200 years. Um, extreme poverty and child mortality, the first and last charts, are way down. Basic education, literacy, democracy, and vaccination are all way up. 
This is human progress. We've got to keep this going. But progress is not automatic. It's not inevitable. It's not natural. For most of human history, we didn't make very much of it at all. Human beings as a species have had higher level conceptual functioning for at least 50,000 years. But most of the progress that we enjoy today, we made in the last 500 years. Uh, the economic historian Joel Machier points out that even the idea of progress isn't natural. Uh, it's a relatively new idea, the idea that we can make progress. And to make progress, we have to believe in it. We have to believe that it's possible and desirable. Most of human history consisted of static societies where no one thought that anything would, could, or for that matter, should change. They wanted stability, not progress. And I think we know from history that progress doesn't always move forward. Uh, and certainly not at a constant pace. It can slow down. It can stop. It can even be reversed or lost. So I think if we care about progress, we have to better understand its causes so that we can enact them and enhance them. We need to ask a few key questions. At least these are the questions that I'm fascinated by. One, how did we get here? Just from starting out in tribal societies with stone tools and fire to this. What were the steps of this amazing journey? Why did it take so long? Why did generations of people have to suffer and die for thousands of years before we unlocked progress? And how can we keep it going? Even speed it up, accelerate it. Conversely, what are the threats to progress, right? What would slow it down, stop it, or reverse it? So, this is the core of what progress studies means to me. But um, I want to go further, and I'm going to claim that progress today is actually at risk. I say this for a few reasons. One is that uh, I think most people don't appreciate progress. Most people don't even know about it. After all, where would they learn about it? Where are they going to get the story from? If you don't get it in school, it kind of falls between the cracks of like history and science classes. right? <coughs> You're not going to get it from the news media who are very focused on negative news, right? If it bleeds, it leads. You don't really get it that much these days from popular culture. Maybe in the 50s, you know, we had a lot of utopian sci-fi and people were very optimistic. These days, I feel at least there's a lot more dystopias um, and a lot of worry about the future and about technology. And it's really hard to get this story on your own. If you go read books and try to figure it out, as I've been doing the last few years, a lot of books are very dry and academic. Uh, dense and difficult to get through. Um, and a lot of the ones that are written for a popular audience are very entertaining, and they give you a lot of entertaining little stories that don't add up to any kind of a big picture. As a result, polls show that uh, most people don't actually believe the world is getting better. Most people would be very surprised to see those six charts that I started with, and if you just asked them, they would guess the charts. If anything, we're going in the opposite direction. But I'm going to go even further and claim that progress is actually under attack in many different directions. Ever since the beginning of the Enlightenment, almost since the Enlightenment uh, began, there was a counter-Enlightenment. Uh, Rousseau and his noble savage concept, back to nature, right? And today, uh, we get a lot of anti-tech narratives are, are becoming very popular, right? Um, tech is invading our privacy, stealing our attention, isolating us from one another. These are the things we hear. Uh, the romantic sort of green movement spreads fear about things that are actually beneficial and helpful, like GMOs. There are attacks from academia, even. Like, uh, Agriculture was a mistake, you hear. Right? Jared Dynan wrote, uh, wrote an essay saying that. Um, and we're seeing the rise of conspiracy theories. Right? Think about anti-vaccination movement. Overall, I think there's a growing distrust of elites and institutions today, including the elites and institutions that drive the world forward, like founders and VCs, scientists and universities, even like courts and the rule of law. So I see threats to progress. I think we see threats from uh, the potential for populist political movements 
that could enact anti-progress policies. Right? When you don't understand where we've come from, it's easy to see the past through rose-colored glasses, right? It's sort of this halcyon past, this kind of garden of Eden from which we have fallen, right? which is the opposite of the truth. And when you don't understand the modern world as a series of solutions to problems, you can propose policies that amount to unsolving problems that we have already solved. That's how progress gets reversed. But even more importantly, I think about the next generation, right, the young people coming up today. We need them to be inspired to participate in this story. These lines, those charts only move forward when people move them forward. And to, to make that happen, people have to be inspired. If no one tells them the story of progress, and all they hear are the attacks, well, who's going to blaze the trail of the next frontier? So here's what I think progress needs. One, we need to tell its story. Tell it as a motivating, captivating, engaging story, which it can be. In a sense, it is the greatest story in human history. It should be told that way. We need to counter the attacks. Counter them with the truth. Well-researched, empirical, rigorous truth. And I think we need to promote progress as a noble quest, especially to young people. Right? A moral imperative. So um, I'm doing this in my own way with my blog and now with my first talk. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of the ways that I think you know what I'm doing is uh, you know, what's what's my sort of particular like take on it. So one is that my stuff's written for a popular audience, and I really try to make it accessible to sort of the educated, intelligent, sort of interested layman with no background, as I tried to do with Steel, uh, you know, in the talk tonight. I also try to give the big picture. I think you might have seen that in the talk tonight as well. I want to connect all these details to a big picture of how we use technology to better our lives. I'm taking a pretty bottoms-up empirical approach. Uh, I want to come to a grand vision, but I'm very deliberately starting with the facts on the ground, like what materials do we use and where do they come from? And as I think you saw in this talk, I take a problem-solution orientation. Um, uh, not enough uh, history of technology, in my opinion, is written about the actual problems people faced and the actual technological solutions. Okay? There's a lot about the human drama, uh, but there's not a lot that really tries to explain to you what was the solution. Uh, I mean, just as an example, I don't know if anyone's read the book Longitude by Dava Sobel uh, about how the uh, about the John Harrison and his marine chronometer. I, I really enjoyed that book. It was great told you almost nothing about how the clock worked. And so I walked away from that and was like, well, grasshopper escapement, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> so what I'm doing right now, uh, mostly I've been writing my blog, and now I'm starting to give talks. Uh, this is the first, and I've already got a second lined up. Soon, uh, I could be doing all sorts of things, audio, video, interactive diagrams, explorable explanations. I'd love to experiment with stuff. Um, someday, I really feel like I have a book in me, maybe a whole series of books. <laughs> um, the more I read, the more I find books that I want to read that don't exist. Uh, there really needs to be a good history of plastic. Ask me later what books I want to read. <laughs> um, and so uh, here's the part where I'm just going to make a little appeal. I am basically looking for ways to do this full time. It's been a hobby so far, but uh, I am figuring out what's next in my career, and this might be it. So. If you uh, want to support this, or you know any way that I could uh, somehow do this full time, or want to help me find it, come talk to me later. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll take questions. All right, sure. I saw a few hands. I think I saw yours go up in the back first. Yeah. So, of the three things that you pointed to that the progress needs, two of them have to do with availability. Yeah. And it seems to me like the root cause is that the popular audience doesn't believe, doesn't care about mobility or as more values. So I'm curious if if you believe that those are the three things that are at the crux of making progress a part of our cultural prerogative, how do you go about making people care about them? My reaction to that is if you're in a society that really doesn't care about truth, 
uh, you might already be lost. Um, or maybe it's just going to take hundreds of years. Um, but I'm not that pessimistic about the world today. I think people can and do care about truth, and I think um, part of it is communicating. Yeah, it's a good question. I think I saw yours. Yeah, it looks like your one of your personal goals is to make people believe in the progress, and that you said it was a blog and talks, and it looks like you're going to keep giving these talks. But who is your audience exactly? Because it looks like I would believe this audience is biased to believe in progress, and that the progress has been so far very good. I would say maybe you're, like, if it's going to continue to be this kind of audience, maybe that's not going to get you to your goal. Yeah, I don't know. I'm at the beginning of this journey. Um, if I, I mean, so I think about things like, well, what if I wrote a book? Who would read it, right? Well, it's the kind of people who read like Stephen Pinker's books, right? Like Enlightenment Now. It's the kind of people who read um, books like The Alchemy of Air, which is about a great book about the Haber-Bosch process. Uh, if you have no idea what the Haber-Bosch process is, it keeps you alive. Um, it, it feeds half the world. Um, it, produce, it, it, uh, it helps produce synthetic fertilizer is what it does. Um, so uh, I think there's a genre of books out there. Yeah, I don't know how popular it is, but I'm just starting with whoever I can reach and see how far it goes. All right, let's work forwards. Yeah, you. Yeah, so it's uh, great talk. I think this is great. Uh, I think this is yeah, definitely going to be great talk. Uh, one thing that I was really interested in talking about since I was reading it, it really is just the community of this project. Yeah. Because I've had, uh, I've actually had the same <clears throat> conversation with you, Tom, because I think that the community uh, tends to be at least, oh, everything you want to do is just kind of about progress. Yep. And so, I mean, I'm just like everybody else, I'm just curious about that. And I think, you know, uh, like how would you how would you respond to the assertion that you know like you look very highly recommended to like someone who's very passionate about it because it's something that like um, what about everything else in terms of like you know this uh, the rising rate of anxiety and depression and kind of lifestyles you know and very trendy and fashion and like all of these other elements that you like really need to think about. Yeah. Um, I remembered I'm recording, so I'll I'll repeat your question um, for the recording in sense. Essentially it's um I talked mostly about economic progress. There's many kinds of progress. Maybe we're not even making progress in every area. Maybe some areas are going backwards. Um, what about that? Um, I see progress broadly in three, uh, three broad areas. So economics is one, kind of like technology, economics, production, and wealth. Um, two is science and growth of knowledge. And then three is the bucket of kind of uh, society, morality, government. Um, I think we've made enormous progress in all three, uh, although there are certainly areas, some have made a lot more than others. <laughs> uh, some seem to be in a much better state than others. Sometimes it feels like, yeah, we're in the space age for technology and maybe we're like way behind in terms of like morality and government. Um, Steven Pinker's book, Better Angels of Our Nature, is actually the best one to understand how much progress we've made in, so in society and government and peace. Um, just killing and hurting each other a whole lot less than we used to, it actually, it actually happens. Um, and uh, his book Enlightenment Now covers really all of these uh, areas, I would say. Uh, but it's true, um, some areas were slipping a bit, maybe some, some are stagnating, if not making progress, some maybe going backwards. Um, I think overall, on the whole, we're still making a lot of progress, but this is exactly why we need to study it, right? What's wrong with those outlier areas, right? Can we focus on those? Please, yeah. And I think one of the interesting conversations that this community could have is exactly that definition of progress. Um, uh, Jasmine started putting together a kind of curriculum, like an academic curriculum of what does this area study, and uh, that definition of progress, how do we define it, and also how do we measure it, were really key fundamental questions. So, uh, I don't know who was next. Uh, ben. Uh, so, one thing I always wonder about with these things is, like, how much of getting them into place requires knowledge and how much requires infrastructure. Mm. Uh, and so you were talking about 
these things happening after a bunch of advances in chemistry. If you had taken Bessemer and dropped him into, I don't know, like ancient Rome or something with the knowledge that he had, would he have been able to set up this type of thing? Or were there other prerequisites that he wouldn't have been able to do? Like, yeah. Yeah, so how much does, sorry, so how much does technology, establishing a technology depend on knowledge uh, versus depend on existing infrastructure and wealth? I don't have a great, like, it's 43% infrastructure, and, <laughs> but um, I think it's a great observation, and it absolutely depends on wealth, right? So to make that super clear, if you drop Bessemer onto, um, uh, into the middle of an uninhabited jungle, he would not be able to build a converter, right? He might not even be able to survive a week, right? If you dropped any of us into the savannah, right, we wouldn't, we wouldn't survive. So... Um, there's definitely, yeah, um, uh, even if we had all the knowledge, even if we, if we had somehow memorized every book in the Library of Congress or all the technology, you need some base. And so, yes, it builds up. Um, and if we ever get knocked back, it's going to take time to rebuild. Fascinating book in this connection is The Knowledge by Louis Dartnell. Um, uh, subtitle is something like How to Rebuild Civilization in the Aftermath of an Apocalypse. Um, it's not really a prepper book, even though it sounds like one from the title. Uh, it's, but it's really a tour of industrial civilization with some thoughts on how you would get it started from scratch. And he talks about how you could leapfrog certain technologies we used to use and get to uh, more directly to more modern ones. Um, yeah, Eunice. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the first column of business. Sure. <laughs> So maybe it's not necessarily that people just believe that products is a pain. It's just that they're not inclined to believe it in the product itself. And so I think with regards to like the first question that was made, it might be more beneficial to say, and even from your point of view, that in this case, to encourage people to believe and to do work that will induce progress, it is not necessarily about encouraging them to do, but it's about selling them the whole story that this is possible. Because increasingly we see that people are just disinclined to place and it's not necessarily that they wholeheartedly disagree with it, it's they have no reason um, to be willing to disagree with it. Yeah. Uh, Daniel. Yeah, I'm curious, like, where you got that from. I mean, what's the, like, the original problem? Yeah. I'm curious to, like, know your mind about that relationship between those problems. Because to me, I don't see it as a full separate problem. I see it as like, a full thing of, like, everything's kind of going wrong for that unit. And then the attack comes by it, but it's progress. Our result or things like that, you can see the big picture. You get kind of a lack of progress in terms of where it's going down, which then feeds into politics and creates kind of some of the situation like we have now. So, so then the solution kind of like attack, kind of attack like the, 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 the see solution the best kind of angle to this, or just, I guess, just kind of a very general angle to like just keep iterating and hacking to like generate progress. I can take some credit for the situation to begin with, which is like new, but having this crazy ass project to slow down, like it just made it way more uncomfortable. So I'm curious to like. Yeah, so I, think you're, so I think you're asking is it um, if progress is slowing down, is that because people stop believing in it, or how much does people stop believing in it because it slows right. down? Uh, good question. Hi, so, high level, uh, I don't know, but I. I think that there is a reciprocal relation. There's like a, there are cycles, right, that reinforce each other, right? So the more actual progress we have, the more people believe in it, and the more people believe in it, the more we get. Um, and I think that is part of why uh, it took so long for progress to get started, because we didn't have any, because people didn't believe in it, and then if people didn't believe in it, they didn't try to make it, and so it didn't happen, and so that proved them correct that progress is impossible, right? And so. Uh, and today, it's, it, we have the opposite. We have a virtuous, um, positive reinforcing cycle. So um, I don't know what to do, except if you have a reinforcing cycle, you just you try to work both angles at once, right? Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, right behind. So we're uh, negating the boundary front off of this here in some over here. Uh, we know that the argument uh, that there's a great stagnation and separation between uh, progress and the goal yep. is a bit stable. Yep. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in software. That the, Great, uh, but 
Clinton was the notice until after a major uh, slide in the presentation. Um, it's a curious thing what's been going on this year. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I didn't think that's where that was going. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so the question is a little bit, what's happened in steel since? Um, <laughs> so um, the uh, a couple of big things I know about since Bessemer, um, there have been a couple new types of furnaces. So there was a, something called the open hearth furnace, which I think actually sort of take over. Uh, also with the advent of electricity, we got electric smelting. Uh, this was particularly useful. So uh, do you know the company Nucor? Nucor basically came in in the, I forget, 70s, I think, and, um, uh, and came up with this whole concept of mini mills, like smaller uh, mills, and I think they mostly did electric smelting. Electric smelting is great for recycling scrap. You can just throw a bunch of scrap in a furnace and zap it with a big arc, electric arc, and that'll smelt it. Um, another huge uh, development overall has been computerized control. So, um, you know, it used to be that uh, iron making was an art, right? And you had to like, so think about, I, I didn't mention specific temperatures, right? But all, obviously all these processes happen at specific temperatures in the thousands of degrees. Now, I also didn't mention that we didn't even have thermometers or a concept of temperature until, well, I don't know, I think the 1700s around there, right? Definitely for thousands of years, people are making metal and they have no idea what temperature their furnace is nor would they understand that question if you even asked it to them, right? Or rather, their answer would probably be uh, in the form of a color, right? It would be red hot or white hot, right? But they had no concept of degrees or how many thousands of degrees it was. Um, so they had to do everything by feel, right? And so uh, they had, it was, you got, you got very attuned to your craft if you were a craftsman, right? You got very, um, you, get, you got to really know the, the metal and the process through your senses. Um, through feeling the heat and seeing the color and all of that stuff. Um, and so then the more we uh, science eyes all of this stuff, the more we can quantify it, measure it, and then ultimately put it under computer control. Um, so every, every heat of steel is just a little bit different, right? No two batches of ore are exactly alike. Um, and so you're aiming for a chemical composition that's like really precise. Uh, at the end of the day, you want... Um, you want tolerances uh, that are just, yeah, just like really, I don't know, parts per million or something, right, in your, in your, um, your alloy composition. I didn't get into alloys, by the way, so there are tons of alloys of steel. You can mix other things in it, and that makes it, um, uh, it gives it all sorts of different properties. Chromium, you mix in chromium, and now you've got stainless steel. You mix in tungsten, you have extremely heat-resistant steel. I didn't mention coatings. Uh, you can coat steel with tin. You get tin cans. Um, I didn't get into it all how we uh, shaped the steel. So rolling mills were developed also in the Industrial Revolution. Um, and there's a whole science around that. Um, eventually, they were able to do this thing called continuous casting, uh, where the, actually the steel would come out of the furnace, and it would just get almost poured directly into like a long strip. And you just get a long strip coming and, and cooling and, and coming right out of the furnace. Um, uh, but the computerized control basically uh, puts the whole, adds sensors and a feedback loop and software to the whole thing to automatically control the temperature and well, the charges, the stuff that you're putting into the furnace, and, um, and get to these amazing tolerances. Um, so I think that's really, and this is one of the great, the, the big stories of manufacturing in the Industrial Revolution and through to today is um, the amazing precision that we've been able to get. Um, and, and ultimately that had to, to, to get the last few nines of precision light ultimately came to um, through computerization. So those are some of the big developments. Yeah. Cool, I really enjoyed your talk. I want to talk about um, uh, the sensors and the sensors around progress, so you kind of observed that uh, people nowadays um, really don't think about progress often, it's not in their mind, or the thing about it is they seem to have uh, often the major view of what's going on around the world. And uh, to me, I feel like um, if we think about people and um, what's going and and their time through life, right, um, on like a, a time axis rather than just like a spatial axis, I feel like a lot of people um, are actually believers of progress in the major or potentially in the 
Um, at least, if not, every, if not a lot of people, there's a much higher percentage. And then once you hit college, I remember a lot of my classmates, like these are now, these are like freshmen who are looking forward to research, and kind of seniors who are like, holy crap, academia is a mess. Um, so to me, I feel like the easier solution for the short term might be to preserve the, pro the, the positive kind of sense uh, towards progress that people already do have when they're young, rather than try to convert people who don't believe in progress to uh, believe in progress. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on um, the state of academic institutions and whether there are any uh, more clear-cut uh, solutions to making it a little bit better. Um, yeah, so the question is basically, do people believe more in progress when they're young, and also can you can you get them while they're young, basically, right? And like, <laughs> Uh, I mean, briefly, I think yes, and uh, I would go even before academic institutions, right? Uh, you want to get them while they're in grade school. Um, one of my favorite startups today, and not just because it's being done by a couple of friends, is a startup called Mystery Science, and um, they are revolutionizing science curriculum and aiming it at grade schools, and so um, that's actually one of the most promising things for like the future of mankind, in my opinion. Um, but I think you're right, there's this quote, I think it was from Douglas Adams, and I'm going to try to do it from memory, I'm going to mangle it, but it was basically like, you know, any technology that uh, came into the world before you were like 15 is just part of the way the world works, right? Anything that came into the world between ages of like 15 and 35 is really cool and exciting and you could probably make a career in it. And anything that was introduced after you were age 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think that's, that's kind of true. How are we doing on time? Okay, we'll take two more and then um, come up and chat with me afterwards. All right, uh, how about, um, I'll take one in the back. Jordan? Great. Uh, yeah, you alluded to China's relative advancement of uh, intellectual communications and the slow of that. Have you thought very much about and studied why this was surpassed so clearly from the so China was ahead in a lot of a lot of ways, actually. Why did the West catch up and then surpass them? Uh, great question. There's an entire academic discipline devoted to that question. Um, it's known as like the Chinese question, or so, I forget what they call it. Um, uh, it was it was the guy's name Needham, I think, uh, asked this question and wrote books about it. Right. Uh, so I don't have the answer. Uh, I have seen some interesting. I have seen some interesting things. Actually, I think uh, Joel Makir's book, A Culture of Growth, has some interesting, has some really interesting ideas in there about how China's society um, uh, was, uh, in, in its view of progress, was actually more of a static society. Right? They valued stability and kind of keeping things the same, and there were cultural, um, there were cultural reasons for all that. But it's true, right? They, they had the compass, they had gunpowder, they had paper, they had uh, uh, some form of printing press. Um, are those, aren't those like the, the great four Chinese inventions or something? What's, do you know? I was just gonna say, it's basically from the same result as time increases, but I'm curious specifically the decrease. So yep. in recent times, we see that the range of regimes continuously decreases, which leads to more complex regimes. So that's something you should know for scientific discovery and things of that nature. And that in turn, encourages more people to invest heavily in The real thing, though, is that almost all societies did not create the Industrial Revolution, right? So the, so the real thing is kind of like not why did China not create it, because nobody, basically nobody did. The real thing is why did it happen in the West, in Europe, and in Britain, and why and when it did. That also is an entire academic discipline. I don't have the answer to tonight, but we can chat more about it later in the moment. Okay, Jay, I'll take one in the front, and then we'll be done. And anybody with your hands up, sorry, come chat with me after. Um, so I'm curious basically about how important you think it is to get some kind of metric on progress. So the reason why I ask is um, it seems to me that the feedback is very important. Um, that enables us to have a sense of clearly what our goal is and then to get a sense of what actually is performing in the world, how to detect uh, that metric. Um, so with the GDP and economic growth, there's a clear sort of feedback loop. Um, and so it seems to me there's maybe two ways of doing this. One is to have some composite metric of progress. And then we can, again, look at how our actions are affecting that. Or um, we could be, we sort of pick um, the major domains of progress and have sort of individual metrics for each of those. Um, so, so 
I'm kind of curious, how important do you think that is? Um, uh, my sense also is that that's, um, this idea is not a new idea of like trying some, some like more, um, um, more meaningful metric of like human development, the human development index, all these different yep. things, but there's been challenges. So um, maybe the question is like, uh, how important is the metric um, uh, as you think of it? Or is it sufficient to kind of like raise awareness that people are excited and like, So how important, so how can we measure progress? Do we have one metric versus many? And how important is all of that? Um, so at the highest level, I feel it is, you know, it's good to quantify things as much as you rationally can and no more than that, right? Um, especially in this domain, there is a lot you can quantify. If you, again, if you read Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, he's got like 70 metrics of progress, right? Or maybe not quite that many, but he's got a lot, dozens and dozens. The whole book is full of charts. And I think pretty much all of those are great metrics of progress. Um, so it is, it is easy to measure many things. It's hard to combine all that into one or even a very small number of like indexes. Yeah, you can create composite metrics. I'm not an expert in that actually. I don't know, I would, I would love to hear from somebody who knows more, how well do composite metrics really work? Do they actually achieve the goal? Um, or are you just sort of fooling yourself into having like one number? Um, but yeah, I think we should measure as much as we can. I think. To the extent that we can't measure, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that we can and then just, you know, do the best for we can. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And please thank Jasmine for organizing. Okay. Um, I, thank you so much, Jason. That was so entertaining and awesome.